Hello and welcome to the Racing Years. I'm Jake Wooten and in this series we'll be talking to some of the great names in motorsport, past and present, and find out the behind the scenes and behind the visor stories of the greatest sport in the world. My first guest is a man that's kept me thoroughly entertained, not only on the circuit, but with his fantastic told stories off circuit too. He was a rising star through the 60s and 70s and raced in Formula 3, Formula 2, Formula 5000 and even some Formula 1 races. Without further ado, Mike Walker. Uh, Jay, good morning and thank you for such a, a really professional introduction there. Yeah, <laughs> That's alright. Um, if we start from the start really, and when was, the, when was the first time you remember getting into a race car for the first time, the first race you went to watch, something that really started your passion and in motorsport? Uh, I think probably the first time would be uh, going to probably a, a hill climb event somewhere like Prescott, Shells de Walsh. This would have been my first introduction to motorsport. Uh, a pal of mine had very understanding parents, so uh, we could go along with a picnic, sit on the bank at, say, Shellsville or Prescott and enjoy motorsport. That would be my first introduction. Uh, probably as about, I don't know, about a 10-year-old, 12-year-old, something like that. Um, obviously at that period I knew exactly who Fangio was and Ascari, people like that. Um, and in those days of course the Le Mans 24-hour race was course, a major, yeah. major event. Yeah. Um, and I was very much uh, enthusiastic for what Jaguar were doing in those days in the sort of um, uh, the late 50s, mid to late 50s, uh, particularly the uh, Curia Cost team, the Scottish team, yeah. uh, winning, I think, in 56 and 57. So those are the sort of early memories. And of course, we mustn't forget our own uh, British racing heroes, Sterling Moss, uh, Mike Hawthorne, and of course, a local man to where we all live in Worcestershire, Peter Collins. Of course, yes, yeah. Uh, and subsequently, you ended up, your first racing meet was at Chelsea Walsh? Uh, well, yes, um, probably not my first. I mean, I started uh, racing in 1964, and all I could afford to do in those days was a little bit of hill climbing and sprinting. So I acquired a very old uh, 500cc car in not particularly good condition, I must admit, uh, <laughs> but we soon sorted that out or tried to. Uh, and initially, being absolutely no one, all you could do was a few minor sprints. Uh, places like that, places like Shelsley and Prescott didn't want to know you until you'd had some experience. Right. So eventually I did, toward the latter part of, uh, or mid part of 64, I got a chance to race at Shelsley Walsh. Um, unfortunately, I thought I was as good as the quickest guys there in our category. And um, I think I'd posted a couple of friends up the hill to just see whether they were taking, is it the crossing or something yeah. flat out or not? The report came back that they were, so I thought, well, if they can do it, I can do it. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, I was wrong. Uh, so the Keith met with a heavy accident, uh, and that just decided me that the thing I really wanted to do was circuit racing anyway. Yeah. So it led on from there. Right. And when was the first point that you, you got your chance at, at, at circuit racing? Um. Uh, the very next year. Um, I mean, I was determined to get into circuit racing. Uh, we sold as many of the salvageable parts from the Keeft as possible, the engine being one particularly uh, salvageable item. Um, and then I acquired an old Cooper, a uh, single seater, because it was always the single seaters that I enjoyed. Right. Um, and literally started Formula Lieb racing, which was uh, effectively for the French free formula. Right. So you were racing against other single seater cars of all different capacities, uh, even up against big Lola T70s and things like that on occasions. So that was exciting times. We did that for a, a full season. Uh, together with some uh, clubman racing that I was uh, able to do as well, uh, thanks to a friend of mine who owned a absolutely super little uh, 1000cc clubman car. Uh, so I packed in plenty of circuit experience uh, in obviously what would be British club racing, which was a fantastic scene. Right, yeah. And if there was a car that you were really trying to, to drive at that point, or even an aspiration to drive in the future, was, was there that person who was driving the car that you really wanted to be in? Uh, I think, to be perfectly honest, even from those early days, it was a, a sport that I not only wanted to be involved in, I wanted to go as far as I possibly could with it. Um, and I think, yes, when you look at I was determined to get somewhere with it if I could. 
but nevertheless he enjoyed it tremendously. And if you don't enjoy something, you won't be any good at it anyway. Of course, yeah. And so Formula 3 started and you were... Well, that, yes, I had obviously to build up some experience in club racing. You've got to know the circuits. You've got to take yourself from inexperienced novice level and improve. Uh, but no, by no means up to ace level, I can assure you. Right. It takes a bit of practice. And uh, my father, up until those days, had taken no interest in what I was doing at all. Uh, it was up to me to earn as much money as I could and spend it all on motor racing. <laughs> and... Uh, my father was um, would never have had those opportunities when he was my age, but nevertheless he was a great guy in every sense of the word, and he could see that I was very keen on it. And I can remember one day he said, "Son, uh, it's about time you really knuckled down and got into the business." But I can see this is a, a business he was building, but he could see that I was keen on the motorsport, and he said, "Well, son, do you think you're any good at it?" And I said, well, uh, yes, Dad, uh, what else are you going to say? And he said, well, if I give you the opportunity to go motor racing at a bigger level, what formula have you got to be in? In other words, get it out of your system effectively. Yeah. Uh, either prove you some good or, or, or get out of it. Yeah. And uh, I said, well, it has to be Formula 3, which in those days was quite a step up from club racing, believe me, uh, even at British national level. But that's where it had to be. And he said, well, if I give it the opportunity, there's one condition. And I said, what's that, Dad? He said, don't ever come back and complain if in the future things are different for us as a family financially. There was actually a second condition. The second condition was whatever you do, you and the car will be turned out clean and tidy on every occasion. And he was absolutely right. Yeah. A scruffy team doesn't win anything. No, you're quite right, yeah. You may not be able to afford the latest equipment or the smartest overalls, but whatever you've got can be clean and tidy. So the, four, the first Formula 3 car that you acquired was a... Uh, the first Formula 3, I mean, obviously I was very fortunate then with the help I got. And the first Formula 3 was a, a, a Brabham BT-18, right. which we used in 1966. Uh, the car didn't arrive until quite late in the season, so the British Championship, which was called the Les Leston Championship, yes. uh, had already started. It opened in oh, probably even January or February, but certainly in March there had been quite a few races. My particular car, I don't think we got it until uh, end of April, early May, so we were getting quite frustrated by then. Um, that was a BT-18. I started by racing in Formula 3 in national level uh, and I think I possibly took in one or so internationals in the UK by the end of the season maybe one race but it was all really strictly national level to gain some experience um, and by the end of the season I think I'm right in saying the record books would, would prove it I think I finished fifth in the Les Leston Championship so then you knew this is what I want to do for... Yes, for um, really. in fact, I even had uh, the opportunity of a test drive for Lotus, would you believe, wow. at the very end of 1966. And I can remember going down to Brands Hatch on what was a either a cold sort of November, December day, or it may have been early January of the new year. I forget which now. Um, and they, I was up, up against John Miles. Uh, we had Jack Oliver there to set the bogey times for... A Lotus 41 Formula 3 and uh, a Lotus 47, which was the uh, the proper full house GT right. 47. I think you got an FVC engine, right. FVA engine. Yeah. And we did the test. Um, I won't go into the details of that now because that's a story in itself. Yeah. But I didn't get the drive. They quite rightly gave the drive to John Miles. Um, and I can remember when the phone call through came through a day or so later, I was obviously bitterly disappointed. And I can remember my father saying to me, son, it's okay, you weren't ready for that yet. And he was quite right. I, would, I was too young, too immature, and too inexperienced. And he then said, I think we can do one more year in this financially. Yeah. But that had to be, this is 1967 then, this would have to be a full international year. Uh, so we would obviously want a little bit of management on our side. Uh, and we would be racing in all the, the sort of magic circuits, uh, Monaco, Rouen, Reims, Clermont-Ferrand, um, yeah, all these it. sort of places. 
this was this was the the the, the year to prove yourself or it or was not, effectively sort of a make or break year yeah. from that point of view my father's support could not have gone on beyond that uh, i knew it and he knew it um, so you had to be think it through you couldn't afford to smash much up during the season yeah. uh, or blow too many engines up or even blow <laughs> Well, yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, without his support, I may never have got the next stage. And am I correct in thinking that this was the year that you had a fairly big accident at Crystal Palace? Uh, well, at the very end of it, yes, or toward the toward the very end of the season, um, we did have uh, quite a successful season. Um, I don't think I won many of the major events, uh, probably even only one, but uh, nevertheless we had some very good finished places, this sort of thing, one or two lap records during the season, yeah. and of course we were racing just in front of the very teams that one day I would hope to possibly drive for, yeah. uh, and of course that proved to be the case. Fantastic, yeah. Um, so going back to accidents and things like that as much as it's a bit of a somber uh, topic uh, yeah um, the accident um i know the one you mean yes. um this I mean, was the one you, you were pronounced effectively dead at the scene uh, um, yes <laughs> um this was uh into september 67 so we were well through the season uh there were probably about four or five major internationals remaining um, and this was a, a very important race at Crystal Palace. Crystal Palace is a circuit that nobody uses today. Obviously, it was deemed to be too dangerous. Yeah. I mean, it was fairly dangerous even in those days. Really, yeah. um, but it was really quite a testing circuit, very tight, that sort of thing. Um, and in the race, you would have had Derek Bell, Harry Stiller, Tony Lanfranchi, Morris Nunn, myself, and quite a few others. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember exactly what stage in the race, probably close to halfway through the race. Um, Morris, uh, Morris's car coming from just behind me, we just made contact. Uh, his front wheel went just in front of my rear wheel, and that threw my car, uh, supposedly, I've got the photos to prove it, about eight feet in the air. It completely uh, somersaulted or a victory roll, as the fighter pilots would call it. <laughs> uh, this is before seatbelts appeared, by the way. So halfway through the roll, I was already halfway out of the car. Wow. Uh, the car, thankfully, landed almost on four wheels, but simultaneously hit the wall which surrounded Crystal Palace. Yeah. And I was immediately thrown out of the car right into the wall. And if you like to add insult to injury, the car then jackknifed and hit me again. So. Um, what actually happened is that the impact was so terrific. Um, no, uh, it didn't. It didn't even scratch my new Bell helmet. But the impact was so <laughs> terrific that it stopped my heart beating, and I was incredibly lucky. On that day, on that corner, was in at those days um, was a young doctor uh, who knew exactly what he was doing. He got to me immediately, and I. I think I'm correct in saying he started my heart beating again at the track side. The race continued, even with the ambulance on the track, and Crystal <laughs> Palace was pretty narrow. You just cannot imagine that happening today. Uh, I was carted off to uh, a South London hospital, and the next thing I can remember was coming round in what was a little small room, which I suppose was their a sort of intensive care room. Yeah. And I remember I got my father by the bed, and I think Ralph Broad of Broadseed Engineering. Mm -hmm. Ralph was taking interest in my career and had then done me a downdraft engine for that very race, my first wow. event with a downdraft engine. And I can remember my father just saying, it's all right, son. You've had a bit of an accident, but you're going to be okay. Just rest. At that point, I obviously went to sleep again. And the next real memory I have was waking up in one of the wards. This must have been a day later, I think. Uh, and this was just like a long school dormitory, beds down both sides. And in those days, you had iron beds. They weren't anything special. Um, and by the side of your bed, you had a wooden cabinet and a little wooden chair. Uh, and sitting in the chair next to my bed was a policeman. And I thought, that's a bit strange. And the guy in the bed next to me was handcuffed to the bed. Quite a quite an experience to wake up to. I don't think I ever dared ask what he'd done, but um, they got rid of him fairly shortly. Uh, so that was Crystal Palace. And um, it took me a, a few weeks to just recover from the bruising and the effects of that uh, thing. But there wasn't a moment where you thought, this is... This is 
dangerous, you know. I, 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 I knew it was dangerous, <laughs> uh, most definitely. But if you're thinking of wanting to stop, no. No, it was, um, it was too late by then. <laughs> and that's interesting because I do remember one team manager many years later uh, saying to me that he always preferred a driver. I mean, teams couldn't afford drivers that smash much up in those no, days. Course, no. But he said he always preferred a driver who had had at least one good accident. And by that, he meant one serious accident. Yeah. Good in as much the driver would have survived, of course. And when I asked why, he said very simply, because then I know he really wants to do it. He's got a point, yeah. Good way yeah. of summing it up. I suppose so, yeah. Um, right. Was there a conversation with Mo afterwards, uh, after you recovered and well, things? Well, um, we both knew what had happened um, and I think it was put down as a racing incident. Um, he wouldn't have done it deliberately. Um, it was very close at Crystal Palace. Yeah. And the, um, the sort of almost a double ir irony really with that, um, you'd fast forward, goodness me, how many years? Because um, that was Formula 3, 67. I was then in Formula 3 in 68, then Formula 2 and Formula 5000 for a further three years. So we're going on. Uh, and Morris Nunn actually tempted me back to Formula 3 at the very end of 71 in order to do a full season with him in 72. <clears throat> right. Um, so in 1972, I did actually drive for Team Ensign, uh, owned and run by Morris Nunn. Mm -hmm. And the first time I'd been back to Crystal Palace since that accident, not that we'd avoided it by any means, but yeah. Formula 5000 just didn't go there, yeah. was that very race when we took the Ensigns, or the Iberia Ensign, uh, to Crystal Palace in 72. Wow. So that was quite an interesting day for both Morris and myself. Yeah. You tell a, a great story about um, sharing the same engine builder as James Hunt. <clears throat> Uh, yes, uh, well, nearly that, getting into um, that would have been in, that was in '72 as well. Um, but we're sort of fast forwarding a bit there. '72, um, um, Morris had obviously built the ensign back in 1970-71. Uh, uh, had had success with Bev Bond in Formula Three with it in 1971. Um, invited me back to do a few guest drives for him toward the very end of 71 to see if he could really tempt me to come back and do a full season. Um, there were reasons for doing that. Um, as much as I had really enjoyed every minute of being in Form 5000, in terms of my career path, it hadn't quite worked. Right. Um, Underpowered car or you just... No, no, not, not that at all, really. Um, Peter Gethin, Howden Ganley had both progressed from Formula 5000 into Formula 1. It just simply hadn't worked for me. Right. Um, in, and I was determined to possibly take a step back in terms of da back down to Formula 3 to sort of prove the point again. Piers Courage did it and did it very successfully at one stage to reinvent his career. Um, we knew we'd got uh, sponsorship that would have come with me, which was Iberia Air Airlines. Uh, so obviously that was interesting to Morris and to Ensign. And it would be a two-car team badged Iberia Ensign. Right. Uh, and so that's what we decided to do for 72. I see. Right. And so you'd done Formula 5000 by this point. Um, how did you find it? So you were in the first year of uh, 1969, would have been the big wings, and you would have been driving a Lola, is that correct? Uh, yes, that, that's right. Um, what was you like driving? Having the done wings? the Formula 3, uh, it was obviously quite a step up to step in from one litre to, to five litres, yeah. um, but you soon get used to it. Yeah. Um, the early Formula 5000s, with the exception of the Works McLaren and the two Works Surtees cars, which were really rather nice cars, the early Lolas were very much the foundation of, of the start of the formula. Without them, the, you know, it would have been very difficult. Yeah. Uh, but they were tube framed. They were not on a par with the McLaren or the, uh, the Surtees. Uh, the Works car was driven by Mike Halewood. Uh, and driven extremely well. Um, and we had a privately owned uh, Lola uh, run by Alan McKechnie of Alan McKechnie Racing. Right. And it was uh, 
you're quite right, it was the early part of that season was the high wings, which mm-hmm. were just faintly ridiculous. Um, <laughs> they were dangerous. Uh, and of course, Formula One suffered some uh, pretty alarming breakages uh, in the Grand Prix races. We also suffered breakages with them in Formula 5000 because you're going just as fast. Yeah, of course. Um, and when one of those let go, you were going way too quickly for the corner you were in. Yeah. Simple as that. So yeah. you were heading for a big accident. You told me a story previously of a, of a bird hitting one of the, the wings. <laughs> yes. Um, that was a day testing at Castle Coombe. Um, and literally, I can remember a crow taking off from the, um, as I was sort of approaching the backside of Castle Coombe, which is Old Paddock Bend, or as it was. Yeah. You're going pretty quickly there. Yeah. And this crow literally came either off the track or up from nowhere. I can almost remember ducking, although I probably didn't <laughs> need to. And uh, it hit the wing, shattered the wing. It didn't do the crow any good, mind you, but it shattered the wing. And um, I literally went off the road, simple as that. Well, yeah, it's crazy. Um, so in those Formula 5000s, you ended up doing a few non-championship Formula 1 races. Uh, yes, we did, um, yeah. What was that like, driving with Jack Brabham and, and Graham Hill and people like that? And well, it was a great experience. I mean, I, I'd had the opportunity to race against uh, many of those sort of hugely well-known drivers, sort yeah. of Stuart, Rent, Brabham, people like that, in Formula 2. Um, but in the Formula 5000, we almost, I mean, obviously I wouldn't have had as competitive a car as them in no. Formula 2, unfortunately. Um, but then in Formula 5000, these were effectively the non-championship races that in those days took place, uh, the Gold Cup at Alton Park, mm-hmm. uh, the Daily Express International Trophy at Silverstone, Race of Champions at Brands, and there were one or two abroad as well. I can remember right. doing one out at Hockenheim where uh, Lotus sent out, I think it was Emerson for the Paul Day with the turbine car right? Um, and that sort of thing. So we did, particularly at something like the Daily Express or the Gold Cup, we had the opportunity to, um, if you like, bolster the field. Uh, in other words, there were Formula 5000 cars in the race. Yeah. Um, and whilst we could, let's say, get off the line as quickly as a Formula One, uh, we would have much the same top speed. We weren't uh, going to have quite the same handling uh, cal- characteristics. Right. Um, we'd got a, a whacking great engine sitting in the back that weighed um, about twice the weight of a Formula <laughs> One engine. So yeah. they weren't going to be as well balanced. Yeah. And was that sort of a pinch me moment? You knew then that that was fairly special uh, to be racing with those sort of people. And yes, it was. I mean, t- you know, if I look back at the scrapbook now um, and can actually say I sat on the same grid uh, on more than one occasion with the likes of Jackie Stewart, Chris Amon, Jack Brabham, Danny Holm, Jochen Rint. Uh, yeah, yeah, wonderful. I mean, is there a story that sticks with you from those? It could have been from Formula Three days, but but a, a story that really sticks with you as a as a a fantastic time. Um, oh, there were so many good moments. Uh, there really were. I mean, the the early days in the one liter Formula Three, um, particularly my first year in six to seven, travelling on the continent. Um, it was just a big adventure. I was twenty one years old. Um, felt I'd got the world at my feet, and that you could do anything. Um, yeah. Well, you know the feeling. You're not much <laughs> older than that yourself now. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was a wonderful moment. I mean, don't forget in those days, we traveled abroad with um, no such thing as mobile phones or satellite navigation. Oh, um, you left with a few pounds in your pocket, probably a few traveler's checks. I seem to remember them in those days. Um, a road map, and you knew where you were heading for, and that was your lot. Right. Um, so you traveled with a lot of common sense. God. Yeah, and you said that there were sort of three of you that, that would share a, a camper van. Uh, a Volkswagen camper van with the car on the back and you just tore through Europe really swapping seats somebody would go and sleep in the back and and the next person would drive and 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 um, navigate sort of thing and you'd swap around. Certainly tra- traveling in Europe obviously there was quite a distance between the races you would sensibly go out and do more than one race at a time yeah. uh, because the better known you got, you were get, we were getting starting money, completely unheard of nowadays. It's yeah. all, the, the whole structure has changed. And um, in 67, um, we definitely, obviously with my father's financial support, we definitely needed a degree of management. And hence we ran under the Frank Manning 
Racing or Frank Manning Racing Limited banner. Frank would handle all the uh, negotiations for start money, all the entry forms. I mean, Frank could speak perfect French and I think other languages uh, could write letters in French, Italian, German, no problem at all. Yeah. And we needed a degree of that. Um, but you're quite right, the traveling arrangements in 67 we used, I wonder if people can even remember what they look like now, VW pickups, and these things had, I think at best they were about 1500 cc, and they didn't go very quickly, but they were economical. <laughs> They're quite sought after now, really. With uh, uh, They are yeah. quite a collector's <laughs> item now. Well, obviously the Beatles certainly are, yeah. and, uh, the, but the pickup was much the same engine. Uh, we had obviously an aluminium uh, sort of built sort of structure on the back, canvas covered, yeah. so the car was protected. Uh, the little Formula 3 car, in this case a Brabham, would sit, uh, would go in backwards with just the nose sticking out through the <laughs> canvas cover at the back, and we would travel either two up or three up. And if it was three of you, uh, they were pretty cramped in the cab, so somebody would drive, somebody would navigate, and the third person would sit between the wheels in the, on the, uh, of the Brabham, <laughs> or probably even sit in the Brabham. Um, so we would travel across Europe like that, yeah. get to the meetings, and when you arrived there, you'd got to obviously find either your hotel, your B&B, or your accommodation, uh, and equally, preferably, try and find somewhere where you could work on the car. Yeah. You tell a great story from when you were six or seven of, of meeting in this island for the first time, which sort of comes full circle throughout your racing career. Um, could you tell us a bit about that? That is, I, I know exactly what you're referring to there. That is possibly more than any particular moment that made me decide that I wanted to be, if you like, in quotes, a racing driver. Um, I would have been, uh, I would have been 15 years old and obviously I'd had the, the interest in motorsport, mm -hmm. uh, but a friend of my father's uh, actually, uh, oh, I think he was a, the, the, works, uh, the service manager or maybe even the manager of one of the local um, distributorships, very keen on motorsport, and he had a Vauxhall Cresta with a Brabham conversion. Wow. Um, <laughs> and he said to my father one day, would the boys like to come with me for a day up at Alton Park? And this was early 1961, and it was the race, I think it would have been about April 61, and it was the race where the E-Type Jaguars appeared for their first ever race. Wow. So this was quite an important race. And sure enough, my brother and I said, yes, please. I have a younger brother, uh, yep. Tony, who's about three years younger than me. And uh, this man, Mr. Saunders, gave us an absolutely fabulous day. I can remember particularly watching the way he drove all the way up to Alton Park. This man knew how to drive. And I mean sympathy for the clutch, the gear change. This was a column gear change on the Vauxhall Crestor yeah. in those days. So that was one of the things that made me notice. And at Alton Park, um, there were races for Formula Junior. Um, there, would have, I don't, there wasn't a Formula One race, there was a Formula Junior race, a big sort of sports car race, um, and the main race of the day was effectively, I suppose you'd call them Grand Touring cars, the two E-Type Jaguars, mm -hmm. and on the front row was the, uh, the two E-Types with Roy Salvadori and Graham Hill. Uh, alongside them would have been Mike Parks with a Ferrari GTO. Right. And next to him on the front row was Inners Island with an Aston Martin DB4 GT. And um, my father is Scottish, by the way, so I probably hadn't mentioned that. So Inners Island was definitely the ones, one of the drivers who was on my sort of yeah. feature list there. I'd noticed him beat uh, Sterling Moss at Goodwood a couple of times with the new Lotus 18, I think in 1960. So the chances of sort of seeing him race up there was something I was looking forward to. And I'd got a lovely little autograph book, uh, and I can remember getting an autograph from Graham Hill, which was a very outstanding autograph, Roy Salvadori, people like that. And I can remember my brother and I noticed Inners Island walking across the paddock at Alton Park, heading for what was then the Esso Caravan. And in those days, it was nothing more than a caravan. <laughs> and we approached him and politely asked him for his autograph. And he said, yes, certainly, boys. And as he turned, to speak to us, he handed to me his helmet and gloves and said, would you just mind holding that for me for a minute? I'll only be just a minute and I'll be right back. At that point, he went into the SO caravan. He knew exactly what he was doing. He absolutely made our day. And when he came out, a moment or two later, 
he signed a perfect Inner's Island, and it was a very, very strong signature. Uh, chatted to us for a minute or two. Um, we thanked him, obviously. That was the first time I met Inner's Island. From then on, he was number one hero, without a doubt. Yeah, and it was nice because that probably wasn't as much of a thing for him as it was for you, but it really kick-started your racing career, if you like, and, and um, lit a fire that, that you wanted to be oh, following his Very, well. very special day. I can remember it vividly now. Um, I would obviously, later on, when I was racing in Formula 3, Formula 5000, I would ultimately get to meet him on a number of occasions, get to know him a little bit better, that sort of thing. Uh, but really, that was the starting point. And he ended up being the person that introduced to the BRDC, is that correct? Uh, that is absolutely true. Which yes. is probably yeah. a big moment for you to... Very much so. Uh, I mean, back in those days, I mean, it was and still is a very prestigious club to be a part of. Yeah. Uh, back in those days, there were obviously very fewer members than there are now. And in those days, you didn't even think of applying for membership. You waited until somebody tapped you on the shoulder and said, I think it's time you were proposed. Yeah. Um, and that man for me was Innes Island. That's so Innes proposed me for my membership. Wow. Recently, not recently, uh, but f a few years ago, you purchased a, a BT21, a Brabham BT21, which is very similar to the car that you raced in period. How do you think it compares to racing back in period? I might, well, I must admit, when I stepped into it for the first time, um, it was just as I remembered it. Um, <laughs> They were a very special little car. Um, in fact, all the one litre Formula 3s were just, in the most part, they were beautiful little cars. And of course, it was such an important formula. Uh, it was very much the stepping stone to Formula 1 in those days. Yeah, of course. It was the junior international formula. Uh, for most of that period, there was also a Formula 2 in various forms, uh, and then Formula 1. Yeah. Um, it's changed quite a bit now. I mean, there are quite a number of, um, I won't say starter formulas, that's being rude to them, but there are a number of formulas that, that you can get people into. can launch their career in. Yeah, and I should mention that's that's how the two of us know each other through um, through your BT21 and going to help you out on race days and things like that. And without blowing your trumpet, really, it's still great to see you racing and you get in the zone and... I've seen you do some fantastic things in, in a car um, that it's just, it's magic to see you at racing still. And I think you enjoy it as much as, as much as we enjoy watching sort of thing. Um, well, I think you're being a bit generous to me there. I mean, there's no doubt a, a 70 year old isn't going to beat a 20 year old and that's for sure. Um, but it's great to see uh, quite a spread of ages in the one litre formula now as we see it in, in historic. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have some very talented uh, young men racing with us. Uh, we've equally got some still pretty talented 60s and 70 year olds, well, yeah, um, yeah. which is great to see. Um, a really nice sort of family atmosphere to it. No, it's, it's great. Um, I think we've pretty much answered this one really, but to finish up, if you could tell us who you think the best driver was or is, that'd be uh, a nice end. Uh, an impossible question. Um, you can only look in different eras. Uh, I mean, clearly, one of the ones who was clearly outstanding in his era was Fangio. And I think many people regard that. Uh, then you move on to the next era, Jimmy Clark. Um, but I wouldn't like to single anyone out, to be perfectly honest, because I know from uh, seeing it at any one period, there is always a good crop of drivers and it could be any one of them that could be the dominant one if all the rest of the pieces fit into place the right chassis, the right engine, the right choice of tyre company, yeah. all these things made a big difference in period. But undoubtedly, there have been some exceptionally good ones throughout the period. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your time. And uh, it's been great. And I hope to see you racing just as you have been. And uh, that's it really. Jake, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.